So let's get started. So as a quick review, so uh, what we'll be discussing today. Um, so we'll start with problem black uh, problem background, uh, like what for uh, projectile parameter estimation is, why it's so useful, and uh, what the different kinds of uh, optimization schemes are, and how uh, meta optimization theoretically more efficient than all of them. And then we'll discuss the design of the optimizer, um, meaning a brief overview of the theory of meta optimization. Uh, we then discuss the issue of auto tuning the meta optimizer and uh, what auto, what auto tuning is, the ways of doing it, and uh, then the experiment I conducted in order to determine the pros and cons of each of these methods uh, for auto tuning and some of the shortcomings in the experiment will later be investiga uh, investigated. Um, then the experimental results, and uh, finally a few minutes of Q and A. Um, so projectile parameter estimation. Uh, so we first uh, obtained trajectory data obtained from a uh, flight testing or TFD slash RBD flyouts, and then uh, but these myth these methods have their issues. For one, flight tests are very expensive, and CFD slash RBD fly uh, flyouts have a very long computation time. So what do we mean by uh, flight testing? So uh, flight tests can, um, so what we do is that we uh, literally um, launch this projectile and record some of its data, maybe by taking pictures and then, uh, um, then uh, obtaining data from those images. And um, typically flight tests give us a small data set for uh, projectile parameters at various points of the projectile's trajectory. Uh, but as I just said, flight tests can be very expensive. So an alternative means of obtaining trajectory data is simulations um, that can be done with reasonable accuracy using CFD slash RBD flyouts. And CFD slash RBD stands for computational fluid dynamics slash rigid body dynamics. And what we do in a CFD slash RBD flyout is we, imp we input the results of uh, computational fluid dynamics code Best tool like ANSYS Fluent, and these results being the various force and moment coefficients of the projectile, we input these into a rigid body dynamics code which simulates the free flight of the projectile. And this rigid body code integrates a six degrees of freedom, 60 OF, flight dynamics model, which propagates the projectile's trajectory forwards in time using the parameters uh, computed by the CFD code. However, this process, I uh, stated earlier, very time consuming, thus it cannot be done with very high resolution. Both flight tests and CFD slash RBD flyouts uh, are perfectly valid ways of obtaining flight data for a projectile, but their respective problems make them a very bad way of obtaining the projectiles, the entirety of the projectile's trajectory. So we instead estimate this trajectory and the various parameters that come with it uh, the, um, by uh, fitting um, our predicted trajectory to our known data points. This is essentially what we're doing when talking about projectile parameter estimation. So about two years ago, a PhD student at Georgia Tech wrote a paper about how meta-optimization uh, could potentially be used as a means of, uh, as a more efficient means of uh, doing the output error method for the OEM. So what is, uh, what is essentially done for doing the OEM is uh, we first form a cost function that directly quantifies how bad our estimated trajectory is given our trajectory data. This first, the first sum in our OEM cost function um, quantifies uh, the difference between our estimated trajectory and our known uh, trajectory values. And the second sum uh, contrain, uh, constrains our optimization space. So we minimize this cost function using meta-optimization, which is what we wanted to do with this research project. So global optimization versus hill climbing. So for global optimization, um, it's intended to locate global optimum. And it typically uses stochastic processes. So global optimization is meant to find our cost function's global optimum, the lowest po uh, point of our cost function. Many global optimizers use stochastic processes. An intuitive kind of global optimizer is a population-based global optimizer. An example of how a population-based global optimi optimization algorithm would work is we put many points, population points, 
all throughout our search space. And these points evaluate whether their observed function value is lower than everyone else's. And if not, move the points should move around until we eventually find one that is. This movement could be a combination of random movements or uh, a combination of random and deterministic movements, um, meaning go anywhere compared to knowing about and going in a certain direction. So the good and bad of global optimization is uh, pro. Um, we even have the ability to uh, converge onto a global optimum. This might not be possible with uh, other types of optimization. And uh, the con is that uh, there's an inconsistent convergence onto the global optimum due to these stochastic processes, right? You might be near the global optimum at one point, and then due to that random motion, we suddenly move away from it. And yeah, so highly undesirable. But uh, so for hill climbing, um, our works is uh, it's primarily intended to find the local op uh, local uh, local optimum. So the operations are highly deterministic. As an example, gradient descent. Um, this is an example of the hill climbing algorithm. Um, you might have experience with gradient descent. So for the good, uh, hill climbing is a uh, an efficient and accurate determination. It's an accurate means of determining uh, local optima for a con. It may not converge onto global optimum. Uh, it really just depends on how hilly the function is. Do we have a lot of peaks? Do we have a lot of dips? If that's the case, our optimizer is going to have a really bad time. Uh, meta optimization, what is it? So, a meta optimizer is, in essence, an optimizer of optimizers. So, it intelligently selects the best optimizer for a bank uh, of optimizers for minimizing a cost function each iteration and we want to design a meta optimizer such that the deployment of these optimizers is smooth, such that it is capable of consistently converging onto a cost function's global optimum. We can ensure this by adding global and local optimizers, which we talked about in uh, our last slide, to our bank of optimizers. So meta optimizer design. Uh, the meta optimizer logic, uh, along with its bank of optimizers, were written in Julia. And Julia is a programming language that was essentially designed for high-speed computation. So when we have this uh, beast of a of a um, of a function of an optimizer, uh, we want our process our processes to be relatively fast. So um, optimizers, differential evolution. Um, for our bank of optimizers, we have differential evolution, particle swarm, quasi-Newton, simplex, and steepest descent. We don't necessarily need to understand how those work, but uh, um, so for our optimizer selection process, uh, we have a variable, it's a variable structure automaton. So what does that mean? Um, a learning automaton, a machine learning algorithm that selects its current action, or in the case of a meta optimizer, its current optimizer based on past experiences in its environment. In this case, the environment is the optimization process. The learning process is an iterative process. Uh, uh, with experience gained and the optimizer subsequently adjusting its behavior. I will more so give an overview of learning automaton theory rather than discussing all of its intricacies. Very vast. Um, so a variable structure learning automaton, more specifically, is a learning, uh, learning algorithm that selects its current action from a probability distribution. So for the meta-optimizer, once it selects its current optimizer, Cost function is optimized for a few iterations using the selected optimizer, and a performance metric is calculated. This performance metric, which is uh, here uh, written under performance metric, is a sigmoidal function that takes in J prime, uh, the rate at which the cost function is reduced with respect to computation time. Um, now, a sigmoidal function looks uh, like a smooth connection between y equals zero and y equals one. So for example, if we uh, say we're near the origin, what it would look like, I'll trace it out for you. We go from y equals zero, and then slowly climb up to y equals one. Why is that useful? Well, if the optimizer uh, performed well, our performance metric should be close to one. You can't say absolutely one, like yes or no. That wouldn't really make any sense. Uh, so we want, we want to be uh, close to yes, so close to one. And if it did poorly, 
the performance metric should be close to zero, close to no. Um, so if the optimizer did well, it is rewarded, that reward being a higher probability of being selected at a later iteration, and if it did poorly, it is punished for the probability of it being selected at a later iteration being reduced. At each of these small periods of optimization, you're updating the probability distribution. That optimizer auto-tuning, so auto-tuning the optimizer. All right, so each global optimizer type of parameters that govern their behavior. So say, for example, we have two codes contain the same global optimization algorithm with the only difference being values for their hyperparameters. These algorithms will, in fact, have completely different behaviors. So poor choice of hyperparameters, uh, yeah, with a poor choice of hyperparameters, global optimizer may never converge onto the global optimum. Uh, global optimum. So this shows the importance of selecting the right hyperparameters, and this higher tuning process must be done by the meta optimizer, hence the name auto tuning. So with auto tuning, we are searching for the set of hyperparameters that yields the most desirable global optimizer behavior for a given function. So this process can be done in many ways, but the three most common are Bayesian optimization, grid search, random grid search, and random search, each with their pros and cons. Bayesian optimization will have a slide of, of its own due to how complex the theory is. But grid search is the process of discretizing the space of hyperparameters, iterating through every set of hyperparameters, testing the optimization algorithm with chosen set of hyperparameters on a benchmark test function whose global optimum is known. See how that would be useful. So determining a set of performance metrics uh, for this set of hyperparameters, pairing the performance metrics against those of other sets of hyperparameters, choosing the one that yields the better optimization performance. This process is incredibly time consuming. So a more efficient method would be random search. Random searching does essentially the same thing. However, a set of hyperparameters is chosen randomly and the auto-tuning is carried out for a fixed number of iterations, significantly less number of iterations necessary for grid search. So, Bayesian optimization, specifically Bayesian optimization with Gaussian processes. So we'll go over the pseudocode, how it works. Um, step one, we first obtain a sample black box function uh, to obtain a vector of observations. So what's a black box function? Black box function is a function where we do not have an analytical form of the, of the function, and we can only obtain information on its topology by sampling it, okay? So the function, in this case, for our meta optimizer, some performance metric, like say computation time or average number of iterations necessary to converge as a function of the hyperparameters. For step two, we fit a curve or higher dimensional surface, depending on how many independent parameters there are for the optimizer to the data using nonlinear regression. X is the space of hyperparameters, and Y depends on the vector of observations, Y. For step three, we put a surrogate model to the curve, or once again, a higher dimensional uh, surface. Um, so what's a surrogate model? A surrogate model approximates the continuous multivariate probability distribution of the black box function that is used to find the black box optimum. Now, for Gaussian processes, in the name, we assume a normal distribution, okay? So that is determined from the probability of finding some value of the black box function given the vector of observations. Now, what mu, uh, sigma r, mu being the mean and sigma being some standard deviation, it depends on, uh, we'll have to go a bit into spatial statistics, so we're not gonna go into it. It's beyond the scope of this, uh, of this presentation. But uh, for step four, we choose an acquisition function. So an acquisition function determines the next best points in the search space given one circuit model. And the choice of the acquisition function depends on one's knowledge of the black box function and uh, information on the various acquisition functions. There are many different kinds. Uh, two of the most common choices are probability of improvement, expected improvement for, uh, for the Bayesian optimization auto tuner I tended to design. Uh, I decided to use uh, expected improvement. And in essence, what uh, these acquisition functions give us is uh, the, is uh, it allows us to work towards a point that is better than the last 
in terms of what you consider to be an improvement. Okay, so step five, optimize the acquisition function, get that next point. And step six, repeat. Keep going until you, uh, until you eventually reach the termination criterion. So uh, auto-tuning experiment, what I decided to do. Um, so for the experiment, I experimented with the global optimization algorithm, Firefly, to determine the pros and cons, the three most common auto-tuning methods. We uh, talked about a few slides ago. So what is the Firefly algorithm? So the Firefly algorithm is a population-based stochastic global optimization algorithm. So population-based, uh, you'll see it in a bit, uh, what, what that optimization process looks like. But you essentially initialize a population of points. You distribute these points about the uh, search space, and these points move around, attempting to find the global optimum. Uh, stochastic, so this movement, is, it can be random. And uh, global optimization, it's a global optimization algorithm. So we want to find the global optimum. So it has two hyperparameters, eta, which governs the rate of randomness of movement of the candidate solutions, gamma, which governs how quickly the candidate solutions converge onto one another. So if this candidate solution has a really good uh, value, then all the points are gonna, you're gonna wanna flock around it. Um, and then same for a different point. Um, so let's review this Firefly pseudocode. I just talked about it a bit. So for number one, uh, po the population is initialized. Step two, an optimality, an optimality metric uh, is calculated for each point. For convenience, uh, convenience we choose this optimality, optimality metric to be the value of the function itself at that point, okay? So points move towards uh, other points with better optimality metrics. So if all points have the same optimality metric, move randomly. So eventually we find a good one. So and then we decrease theta at each iteration. Why do we decrease theta at each iteration? Well, because intuitively we expect our points to be gradually moving towards the global optimum. So we don't want randomness if we're moving towards the global optimum. Auto-tuning experiment continued. So the chosen performance metric to be optimized was the average number of iterations of the optimization algorithm for a given objective function. Um, black box function was created. They're running Firefly 25 times. It was, uh, it took a very long time to run. So uh, recording the number of iterations it took for the population to converge, telling them and taking the average. Um, so the auto tuner was designed to optimize the black box function for a given objective function. Uh, you'll see those in a bit. These uh, objective functions were benchmark test functions. And most of these functions are used in optimization due to their complex topologies. Um, some of them are very simple. You'll see that in a bit as well. And this would be done for grid search and by using optimization. So benchmark test functions. We have elliptic, Regan, Schaefer and two. Schaefer and two is a, is a messy one. And Rosenbrock. So see that uh, Restrigan and Schaefer, very hilly, especially Schaefer and two. Elliptic and Rosenbrock, on the other hand, are very simple. These benchmark test functions were chosen to compare the behavior for when the function topology is very complex, but it's very simple. So one might intuitively, intuitively say that the, comp the computation time, the auto-tuning process for the simpler functions be lower than those for the more complex ones, but we'll see. So optimal behavior. So this is what it looks like for when uh, Firefly has its uh, optimal set of hyperparameters. You see that it converges relatively quickly. Oh, yeah, yeah. All right. Schaefer, vegan. Again, see that it converges relatively quickly. Uh, we can maybe go back and see what those uh, functions look like. The results. So for the first column, we have the name of the objective function, function we optimize. Second column, that uh, randomness hyperparameter I talked about. For the uh, third column, the speed of convergence hyperparameter. And then for the fourth, average number of iterations and the auto-tuning compu uh, computation time. Uh, the computation time numbers might be a bit off. Um, the tool I used to obtain computation time, uh, it tended to be wonky, but that's fine. Um, but interestingly, Elliptic and uh, Rastrigan, which were 
these two these two benchmark test functions, we can maybe go back a bit. See. All right, so elliptic and Restrigan. See the elliptic, uh, Restrigan is very complex, it's topology. Elliptic is rel uh, relatively simple. Okay. So these two test functions had the same computation time for the auto tipping process, despite elliptic being simpler than Restrigan. Um, furthermore, the average number of iterations is smaller for Restrigan for elliptic. And a very interesting result is that, say for N2, at the lowest average number of iterations, uh, to converge, despite it arguably being more complex than a than pretty much every other uh, benchmark test function we worked with. Um, so the reason for all these things uh, simply boils down to what I auto tune for. So an average number of iterations to converge places emphasis on speed of convergence rather than accuracy. And my argument as to why I auto tune for average number of iterations rather than say success rate test rate meaning the number of times the function merged onto the global optimum over the total number of runs is because typically we're dealing with black box functions where we don't know the topology of the function, certainly not a global optimum. So the next best thing is a quick reduction of the cost function rather than the consistently accurate one. So the results above are from the grid search auto tuner I designed with future work potentially being done with the Bayesian optimization auto tuner shortcomings in future work, potentially further develop a Bayesian optimization auto tuner, further explore the theory of Bayesian optimization to get it fully functional. Questions? Okay. Um, so, uh, if you could go back to the results slide. No problem. So, like, the elliptical and the Rosenbach function, yeah. like, here it's looking like it's not the same. Are very similar. Yeah. But the gamma values are like wildly different. One has the lowest, one has the highest. Do you have any kind of intuition for why that might be? Yeah, exactly. That's that's one thing I noticed when uh when I was uh, working with this. I am actually not sure why. I think um I think if I were to zoom in even further, there would possibly be slight differences in the topology, but that's the only way I could I could really explain it. Yeah. Very interesting. Uh, but um. This gamma value determines rate of convergence. So I believe the reason why um, elliptic is so high is because, uh, you know, the, the function is very simple. So it'd be very easy to find an optimum. So, uh, you know, um, there's most likely going to be uh, one of the points of the population on the on the global optimum, and so everything's just going to rush towards it. So this is why this value is so high because you because you pretty much already know the global optimum. You want everything to rush towards it as fast as possible. More questions? questions on that? Right. Did you try um, any functions that have multiple or infinite total minimums, total optimums, and, and did you, what do you think would be expected? There'd be like a, a biased total optimum depending on how you see the initial population, or, or would it tend to kind of cross it to each different one depending on what that's 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 correct. So um, uh, so I did this with uh, go back to that. You see with uh, Restrigan. Uh, Restrigan has an infinite number of uh, minima. So um, you know of local minima. So you would uh, you would expect like points to cluster and all these different uh, all these different dips. And that's exactly what happened. So it actually takes a while to get it to converge onto the global optimum. Because these are stochastic processes, so it's going to be random, you know, what happens. Um, I think after maybe the fifth attempt, I finally got it to converge onto the global option. Did I answer your question? Yeah, and what if, what if those, instead of being local minima, what if they were all local? That's uh, your point. Um, I'm pretty sure they just move randomly. Yeah, there's not really anything to converge to. I don't see anything online. I think everybody. Um, I have one quick question. So in terms of choosing the right function, is that all trial and error, or is there some systematic way to say, okay, this is the right function? Uh, oh, for the experiment? Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
No, it's not really like a like a surefire way to know what works because it's it's all random. So it can obviously do anything. But yeah. Um, yeah. And just another quick question. So I've heard of it. Program. Yeah. What? what? No idea. Okay. Just yeah. Um. Is that, is that related to like uh? I agree. I think it's. I think some of it's um. When I worked with it, uh, some of its uh, some of the syntax was similar to C++. Yeah, so some of it. Yeah. Yeah, probably. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Do I just unplug it? Okay. So the next presentation is by. Jerry Schweiger, right? And he's uh, going to show what he's done in, with his research with Professor Steinberg. So with that, take it away. All right, good afternoon, everyone. As Dr. Opaline said, my name is Jerry Schweiger. Um, thank you for all of you who are attending in person, and uh, hello to everyone who is attending online. Uh, glad to have you here. So today I'm going to be talking about non-volatile particle particulate emissions from the high-pressure combustor rig. This is research I did last year under Dr. Uh, Adam Steinberg along with graduate students uh, Sundar and Jeremiah. I'm bad at pronouncing last names, so I apologize. So, yeah. Oh, that comes the hope. There we go. Good to go. Great, okay. Let's try that again, cool. So, a um, little bit about what we're gonna be doing during this presentation today. Um, first, V. Coleman, bienvenue, welcome to this presentation. Uh, we're gonna start talking about a little bit of the background and motivation as with a lot of engineering applications, we could run any experiment we wanted to, but the big question is why? Why do we care about this? Why do we care about the particulate matter? So we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll talk about a lot of the experimental setup and design. This was a lot of what I was involved in, not the actual experiment itself, but instead, how do we set up this experiment? Uh, facility teardown, just some brief notes on how we, that kind of goes in with the experimental setup, uh, how we prep the facility itself. Uh, some comments on the fuel piston accumulator pipeline that I designed, as well as the unit strut design that I created, uh, the continuing continu continuation of the project, and then a closing along with some time for questions. So those of you who have questions in the room, feel free to ask at the end. Those of you who are on blue jeans, you have the liberty to post questions whenever you want during the presentation. Okay, a little bit of background and project motivation. Um, as aerospace majors, we like to look at pressure and temperature a lot. Thermodynamics likes to talk about pressure, temperature, highly in related concepts. So, uh, in the combustion lab, we're very interested in how combustion, pressure, and temperature, how all these concepts are related to one another. So, looking at the combustion process itself, uh, we notice that higher temperatures tend to lead to this lower tall, what we call a tall cam, essentially a reaction time. Now, why do we care about reaction time? Uh, we want to, uh, the faster reaction time, means that we're going to have a more stable flame in a uh, So we'll talk about that in a second. Um, looking at the effect of equivalence ratio on combustion. This is another thing that goes with the temperature. Uh, what is an equivalence ratio, you ask? Um, we have this thing called a fuel to air ratio. In, in essence, uh, how much fuel do we have and how much air do we have? An equivalence ratio is essentially taking that value and relating it to our stoichiometric values. So taking that stoichiometric equation, are we above it, are we below it? Essentially, are we burning more fuel than we need? Are we burning less fuel than we need? Or rich or uh, strong? So it's given by this equation. We have this little phi over here. Uh, so our actual ratio over our stoichiometric ratio. And what we notice is up to a certain point, so that's the key point is not infinitely, but up to a certain point, uh, when we burn rich, we get a greater flame stability. Now, a stable flame is going to be really important for our combustion process because we don't want this flame going in a fireball out the back of the jet, the jet engine because obviously that'll start to melt some parts up in the back. We also don't want it exiting through the front of the engine because again, melting parts and fireballs are generally bad on airplanes. So um, why do we care about flame stability? Along with that note, uh, we want to avoid combustor blowouts. Uh, and part of the reason be behind that is if a flame goes out in the combustor, it is incredibly hard to relight at high altitude. The technology has gotten better over time, but the fact remains that it is still a difficult process because we're at the high altitude which is going to lead to some different temperature and pressure conditions than if we were on the ground. 
So I'm kind of with that commentary earlier on keeping the flame in one place. We don't want actual movement of that flame. We don't want it going out the back of the out the back of the engine. We don't want it going out the front of the engine. We want to keep it in the combustor. Um, yeah, so low temperature and pressure at high altitudes, relay is going to be a lot more difficult. Um, why would we get flame out? Um, we talk, I've talked a lot about flame stability, but what would cause a flame to go out? Uh, there are a lot of different causes. So first being compressor stall or surge, depending on the case. This is when we have the, an improper pressure ratio moving across our compressor, and that can be either actually moving or um, radially. So radially it'll start in one place and can quickly propagate. And essentially, it's going to cause a blow in the flame, and it'll create many problems for us. Uh, fuel starvation. If we don't have enough fuel to keep this flame going, that's going to create a lot of problems. Uh, no fuel means no fire. Uh, foreign objects. We talked a lot about this with bird strikes whenever people were running tests on that. We want to make sure that any sort of foreign objects in the engine are not going to impact this flame stability. And yeah, that would lead to an unstable flame. So a couple charts here. We see the effects of temperature on the tall cam, so this reaction time. We see that as temperature goes up, we get this reaction where um, we get a, a faster reaction time, which in general is a very good thing to have. As well as we see this um, adiabatic flame temperature and the equivalence ratios, that's what this phi we talked about up here, where in general, as we get richer up to a certain point, up to that stoichiometric point, we can get a higher adiabatic temperature, which is very important for our burner efficiency. Okay, um, now this project specifically. Uh, we're looking at particulate matter and emissions. So why do we care about emissions? For non-aerospace majors, you know, we see a jet engine and say, okay, think about the jet engine as a black box. We care what goes in, we care what comes out, and something happens inside. So emissions are obviously a very important concept with um, the principle of global warming and how that's affecting things, as well as just general public health. So uh, there are a lot of emissions that can come out of a jet aircraft engine, including uh, nitrous oxide, or this NOx, as we call it, as well as some other non biotype non-volatile substances, which is technical jargon for soot. So, uh, why do we care about those emissions in particular? Um, NOx, for example, is poisonous and highly reactive, and depending on where it is emitted, it can create this ozone formation in the upper troposphere, which is the, one of the lower layers of the atmosphere. And I don't know about you guys, but I generally like my air to not be poisoned. Uh, that could be personal preference, but you know. Um, now, soot, how do we generate soot from that, all these um, non-volatiles? This is a result of incomplete combustion. So we talked about that flame stability. If we get an incomplete combustion process, we're going to generate soot, which also generates its own problems. So talking all about that, looking at our investigation, uh, what, do we, what, did we want, what did we want to accomplish here? So we're looking at the combustion process of Jet A, which is a kind of jet engine fuel, at high temperatures and pressure. These are very common operating conditions for any sort of turbojets or turbofans. So we want to analyze that. Particularly with that process, we wanted to study uh, non-volatile particulate matter, so the output of that and the emissions of soot from that. Uh, what applications does this apply to? Uh, jet engines, as mentioned earlier. Excuse me. Also, APUs, auxiliary power units. So that's a funny little thing that we get at the back of the aircraft. Uh, you think about all these electronic systems on the plane, so your avionics, uh, the lights on the plane, those no smoking signs, the seatbelt signs. All of that has to have electricity power in it. Where does that electricity come from? That's where your APU, your auxiliary power unit, comes in. So they're going to provide, so APUs essentially provide energy for any non propulsive function. Um, and there are a lot of them on an airplane. So electricity for the aircraft, and also when we're on the ground, getting that jet engine started. Okay, so looking at the experimental design and setup for this scenario. So this is a model of room 128 in the combustion lab. Now, why did we need to generate a whole CAD model for the room? Uh, those of you who have been to the combustion lab know that space is at a premium. There's a lot of experiments running. So we, want to, we need to make sure that everything fits in this small space so that everyone is able to run their own experiments and procedures. So the first part of this um, experiment was setting up the room and modeling some key locations. Uh, this includes diagnostic laser ball penetration, penetrations, which are, if my mouse will show up, there it is, uh, right here. So these are where we, are, we have our diagnostic lasers. So those are, can be great for some um, laser velocimetry and also just some analysis of that to analyze the soot that comes out of the jet engine. Uh, the exhaust stack, which you can see on this diagram on the right, we have this little circle, as well as this one over here. Uh, we don't want to poison the people who are in and around the room, so we have to have those exhaust stacks modeled to know where our output's going to go. Uh, circuit breakers, power, uh, door frame, something that not a lot of people consider. Uh, getting the experiment set up, we have some rather large equipment. We want to make sure we can move it in and out of the facility without having to break down an entire wall. So 
those door frames would therefore constrain the sizes of different parts that we would be able to use. And then finally, the existing experimental facility. So you see on this model on the left, we have this little wall. Uh, the experiments that went on before us had some uh, blast shields made up of this acrylic material. So we had to remove those before we could set up our current experiments due to the length of the actual rig. Okay, um, facility tear down. So again, room 128. Um, we had this little powder coated steel frame that created a pseudo room that we saw on the left in the previous slide. And that is super important because we had to get that, again, we have to get that out of the way for facing purposes. So we removed those plexiglass and acrylic blast shields as well as the rolling crane, and that just created more space. So this was heavily based on the model that I generated in SOLIDWORKS. Um, along with that, we had to remove um, any remaining fuel and gas pipelines from the previous experimental setup, anything that wouldn't serve our purposes anymore. Again, space is at premium. Uh, we also wanted to model locations, uh, some critical pipelines for the new facility. So all of these, um, all these gas lines, and then finally, uh, we had to model the fuel piston accumulator. So this is where we're going to have be storing all our high pressure, high temperature fuel for the matter. And that is over here on the right. I'm going to be talking a little bit more about the design for the strut underneath that uh, in a second. And the primary purpose, why did we use um, this fuel piston accumulator? Why not just like a random tank with some pressure ends on the end of that? And the important of that is we want to make sure that we keep this um, fuel at a high pressure as well as making sure that it has the function of that nitrogen bleed. That nitrogen, nitrogen bleed is going to be very important to make sure that we don't get any clogged lines and to keep the system running smoothly. Okay, the pipeline design. This was one of my major tasks was uh, designing this actual pipeline from the fuel piston accumulator to the rig itself. So we have a bunch of requirements using, um, you know, the fancy like, systems engineering language. Um, first thing, pipeline shall connect fuel, combust fuel piston accumulator to burner rig. You'll need to get from point A to point B. self explanatory. Uh, next part, pipeline shall have three output flows 2.85 inches apart, measured from the center. That's to make sure we have enough fuel input at these different locations. Uh, if you have questions about some of the specific setups of the actual rig, I can refer you to the grad students who might be able to give you a little more details on that. Um, pipeline output shall align in the same plane. Now, the most important part of this, pipeline output shall achieve uniform laminar flow, or what we call a uh, I apologize for anyone who speaks French in here because I'm going to butcher the pronunciation. Say fossil flow. Uh, essentially, we want to make sure that all of these flows are uniform, so they're all of the same mass flow rate and laminar. So we don't want, for lack of a better term, any jagged or chunky flow. So in order to do that, we wanted to make sure that we had number one enough distance between the actual manifolds. That's the little circular thing here, and these um, pipelines to make sure that we could get that uniform flow. We also wanted no flow bias. We didn't want one of these pipelines to have more fuel flowing through it than the other. In order to ensure that, what we could have done if we didn't care about flow bias is just make a single L bracket and call it a day. However, that would give us more fuel flow through the center pipeline and not enough to the edges. So in order to get around that, you can see um, in figure eight, we have this little drop off into a fuel manifold. And essentially what that does is we go from vertical motion do all this horizontal motion that's going to carry the fuel from the manifold to the actual rig itself. So that ensures that we get a minimum flow bias, so that's something we had to design. Uh, why is it shaped like this? Once again, we want to avoid this, fuel, this um, flow bias, so we wanted to have an evenly distributed 120 degrees for each of those three pipelines. Um, and yeah, we kind of talked about that. Um, the manifold needs to present any sort of flow bias. We want the same flow from each of those three pipelines. That was one of the major design challenges that took us a few weeks to figure out how exactly we wanted to design this manifold to achieve that goal. Okay, um, so now looking at not only the pipeline design, but also the unit strut stand. So you see this, this is kind of a rough model, it's not the best, of the fuel piston accumulator so that long pipeline can fit, if memory serves me correctly, approximately 15 gallons of fuel. So um, this thing can get pretty heavy when it's filled up. And in order to ensure that this fuel is stable, we want to make sure that we're getting minimum vibration. Uh, placing it on the floor is not an option because if this thing starts to shake, it might uh, disrupt the structure. We also want to make sure that there's enough space for this in the facility. So uh, a couple of um, requirements. Uh, number one, we don't want this piston accumulator to sit uh, higher than three feet off the ground because if it does start to shake, we don't want this falling over, causing a fire, breaking everything. Uh, that's just generally not desirable. We don't like things breaking. Uh, we don't want vibrations greater than approximately two centimeters. In general, we want to reduce the vibrations as much as possible. Vibrations are generally a bad thing. If something comes loose, again, 
some stuff breaks. Uh, we wanted to sit, to sit against the south wall. This just kept the accumulator out of the way. So when the rig is off, people are able, actually able to get around the rig, get to the accumulator, perform some maintenance on it. Um, all these tasks that are required to upkeep an experimental setup. Um, yeah, we did also, um, we wanted to make sure that the dimensions didn't protrude greater than three feet from the wall. Again, maintenance purposes. And then the last important part is we want to make sure that this setup can actually hold the weight of this piston accumulator. So, um, it's kind of a rudimentary design, but it's effective. Uh, we have this little design based on these unistrut beams. So, welding all those together, we get this kind of rectangle shaped thing. And that's where our fuel piston accumulator is going to sit on. So, that's where um, we have our unistrut stand. Okay, project continues. So, we talked a lot about design. Um, Unfortunately, I have moved on to another lab in the Space Systems Design Laboratory with Dr. Gunter, so I am no longer a part of this project. However, um, I do like to keep some tabs on this. So, uh, looking forward to spring 2022, that's this semester, uh, what are some of the goals of the project moving forward? Uh, we want to achieve operational status. So, we've talked a lot about design principles, uh, design requirements, the physics engineering behind it. Um, where are we going with this? Uh, the hope is to actually make this up, this system up and running by the end of the semester, and that way in the fall there's more experimentation that can be run on it. So that's I mean, so this semester that includes getting the final design, so making sure that we can actually manufacture a lot of these parts, um, and then also assembling them together. So that's going to include like the actual construction of the rig, the rig itself, the um, piston accumulator stand, and the fuel pipeline. Uh, the latter of those two, which I designed. Um, and yeah, by the end of the semester, we're hoping to get that first light and troubleshoot any issues that go along with that. So if something happens that's like, oh, we need to change one of the design parameters, good to catch that early before you start to run a long series of experiments. Um, looking at fall 2022 and onwards, it's looking at more some of the long-term applications. So as we talked about earlier, this has a high application to jet engines as well as auxiliary power units. So we want to make sure that we can actually use the data we get from these experiments to apply to those scenarios and studying that non-volatile particular output that soot in order to, to reduce these emissions and hopefully uh, make jet engines a little more uh, healthy for our environment and our own health. And that is it. So if anyone has any questions, I would be happy to take them and I will do my best to answer them. If I can't answer them, I can redirect you to someone who can though. So. When it comes to like emissions and fuels, there's a ton of trade-offs. Mm -hmm. um, I was curious, it seems like one of the big trades that you were dealing with was like plane stability and slash like pilots. Mm -hmm. If and have a more stable plane at higher equivalence ratios, so we're like fuel rich. Um, obviously, like we're expending more fuel, but the benefit is that we have potentially fewer emissions. So is this application more directed towards like military performance vehicles or commercial? Because I know for the military, like relay capability is really important because, like you said, they're like at really high altitudes. But the commercial industry, I would think that maybe fuel expenditure would be more. Yeah, so this can actually apply to both of them. So we know this applies to jet engines. Uh, perhaps more important though is we have that APU application to actually provide the power. So. Um, yeah, you're right. The trade off, the big trade off here is we have the temperature and the equivalence ratio along with the emissions. So it can, we can work with multiple applications. That's kind of the take home message with this is we want to make sure that, um, it, uh, regardless of the situation, whether it's military and we're less concerned about the cost of fuel and the weight of the fuel or it's commercial and we are very concerned about the cost of the fuel. We want to make sure that this is applicable to a wide range of things. So this is not only about um, characterizing that soot and other emissions, but also about determining how can we manipulate these variables, temperature, pressure, equivalence ratio, all that fun stuff, and determine what exactly are these trade-offs. Can we manipulate them in such a way that we can not eliminate a trade-off, but get a nice balance between all of these to achieve um, a desirable cost margin as well as lower emissions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I guess that's why I was wondering because you said that like. If you Go to higher equivalence ratios, you get like more point stability. So when would we run? Would we ever? Are you like is this project proposing that we might try to run fuel rich to have like more stable planes, or would we still run fuel lean but potentially inch up the equivalence ratio to gain more stability and take the hit on emission? Put, put your pop back up. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. They uh, just. 
Well, there's another on the next slide. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the increase of people once yeah, right there. Mm. There's a there's a peak. Yeah. Um, Saturday, and also, I just like add on to that a equivalence ratio maps into adiabatic point temperature. Like it, it's like a, adiabatic point temperature is equivalence ratio. If you burn hotter, all this nitrogen that's found in the air, since it's an air breathing vehicle, is going to dissociate and bond with O, which is going to produce even more NOx. So mm -hmm. I guess like, yeah, if we're running fuel lean, where where do we find that trade? Yeah, so that's all. Of the, what, this, what this experiment is trying to find is. Not necessarily as we burn fuel rich as in like above an equivalence ratio of one, but what happens when we take that equivalence ratio, let's say, I don't know, 0.8, or, and what happens as we start inching it up little by little? Can we find a way that we can reduce these emissions while burning a slightly hotter, uh, slightly uh, fuel, more fuel rich uh, combination? I guess my last question, I'll. No, you're good. Uh, is that, good. Uh, I think you said you had a, like an Nitrogen weed system. Yes. Like, I guess that's where purging the lines. Yes. Okay. So, is it, would there be any situation where that nitrogen would, like, are you using nitrogen to pressurize the fuel tank? Yes. So you have, like an OLED? Okay. Right. Uh, I guess is there a focus on like the steel design? Because I guess if you have nitrogen that accidentally like dissociates into the fuel, then you'd be adding nitrogen, which could potentially produce even more NOx. So, like, is there like a steel design to prevent that from happening? Yeah, so that's part of the reason that we chose this um, particular piston fuel accumulator is um, I'm not an expert on the exact design of it, but it's set up as such that we want to um, keep it pressurized by that N2, be able to have the N2 be able to purge the system, while also simultaneously ensuring that we don't have that uh, high mixture of fuel and nitrogen together. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. yeah I can add two cents to that too. You know, always running inside, but yeah. what happens is, and, and so if you look at the curve, the push knocks down, you want to go leaner and leaner. But as you go leaner and leaner, that's when stability starts to be up. It's kind of a sweet spot yeah. that, that people look for. And then now, so it has its trends too that would be superimposed on that. Um, and we'll take that into account. And I guess, like, if it's since this is an air breathing engine, you, you have throttle capability. And so, like, yeah. During a flight, you could probably, you know, you can adjust your equivalence ratio to, you know, that you need to relight. Okay, take a hit on emissions for yeah. a 20 minute window where you know you're going to potentially have to relight your engine. That's right. They're almost always down here. Yeah. And of course, afterburners are falling fuel right out of the tailpipe. You don't care about performance of it. Well, you do, but. Uh, does that affect, like, your global and soon, measurements? Yeah, well, as soon as you go to an afterburner. Everything's out I'm not really worried about emissions. Yeah. yeah. Okay, any other questions? Did you do any like uh, CFD or different flow analysis of the fuel manifold to see how um, uniform either like laminar flow or just like the fuel bias that you yeah, so that was one of the next steps that's hopefully going to be happening, that hopefully hopefully happened, I should say, at the beginning of this semester. Uh, that manifold design was finalized at the very end of last December. So unfortunately, I did not have the opportunity to carry that out. Um, but yeah, so we finalized that initial design based on some assumptions, and then the hope was that we would run some CFD at the start of this semester. So, so we have one online too from Jonathan. Mm -hmm. uh, Bozier? Yep, delivered. Yep. Okay, so it says great great presentation, Jerry. Just curious, what was the biggest challenge you faced project? Facing the roadblocks with Bruno. Yep. So the biggest challenge is um, kind of going along to that um, the fuel piston accumulator and more specifically that pipeline. Um, again, we wanted to achieve that um, plus sales style flow. And so the biggest challenge was making sure that um, we had already designed this stand for our fuel piston accumulator. We had that given height. We knew the given height of where our rigs would stand. So the biggest challenge is number one: how do we get it from point A to point B while splitting it into these three um, fuel lines? So getting that uh, three-way split without a flow bias. And number two: how do we make sure that we can get that three-way split soon enough that we can achieve that laminar flow? Um, in, in other words, um, we could have made it at an angle and just said, "Okay, split into three right before the fuel rig," but then we wouldn't achieve a laminar flow from that. So. Uh, biggest challenge was uh, trying to tackle a, the, this manifold, not only in a way that would um, theoretically split it into a 
be laminar flows and free uniform flows, but also in a way that could practically be manufactured, something we don't often consider a lot in our engineering classes, uh, but how can we actually manufacture this part? So um, this took a few different design iterations and we finally settled on this disc style design uh, that would be a little easier to manufacture than some of the other um, less practical models we came up with. So yeah, I'd say that was our biggest challenge and I'm very, very happy with what we came up with. Simple but effective. Great. Any other questions? Right online. Anybody? Any other questions? <laughs> yeah, I think that's it. So, thanks, Jared. <laughs> <Nice job. laughs>